We're now live on YouTube, councillors. Thank you very much. Um, so can I welcome everybody to this virtual cabinet panel on community engagement and cooperative development that's being conducted with councillors, officers, guests and partners at various locations, mostly I suspect in their houses, um, communicating via audio, video and online. There's also the opportunity for the public and press to listen to and view proceedings. And we also have contributors from various organisations with us here to provide feedback. Before the meeting starts, and I will be saying a bit more about this panel when it does start, I'd like to invite the committee member and scrutiny officer, Anna Gavea, to explain how proceedings will work and to confirm that members, councillors, officers and registered speakers are in attendance. Thank you, Chair. I will firstly undertake the roll call. When I call your name, please could you indicate your attendance to confirm that required members, officers and registered speakers are present, can hear and be heard. So firstly, Councillor Judy Billing. I'm here. Councillor Keith Hoskins. And I'm here. Councillor Ruth Brown. I'm here. Councillor George Davies. I'm here. Councillor Jean Green, I think she's given her apologies. She said she might be late. Councillor Simon Harwood. Hello. Hello. Um, Councillor Michael Weeks. Don't think he's here. Absent. Councillor Ian Albert. Present. Thank you. Um, officers, we have Steve Crowley. Yes, I'm here. Chloe Gray. Yes, I'm here. And Hilary Deneen. I'm here, thank you. Thank you, and myself, and thank you to Mark Robinson for doing the IT for us this evening. Uh, guest speakers and members of the public, we have Anna Peachy. I think we might have lost. Yes, I'm here. Oh, we've got you, Anna. Sorry, you're back. Thank you. Um, Jill Chapman, Create Seven. Yep, I'm here. Paul Webb, Transition Town, Letchworth. John Webb. John. Present, thank you. thank you. Hannah Morgan Gray, North Heart Centre for Voluntary Service. Yes, I'm here. Alexander Jarosi, uh, North Heart Centre for Voluntary Service. I haven't seen Alex. No, he's absent. Uh, Rosie Waters. Yeah, I'm here. Hello. Catherine Bennett, Citizens Advice, North Hearts. Yeah, I'm here. Hello. Liberty Platten Hawes, Citizens Advice, North Hearts. Hello, I'm here. Hello. And we also have Councillor Martin Steers Hanscom. Yes, I'm here. Councillor Michael Muir. I'm here. Thank you. And Councillor John Bishop. Sorry, I was just unmuting myself. Yep. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I'll now move on to the proceedings for this evening. Excuse me, um, sorry to interrupt. Um, Catherine Bennett has joined us uh, late. I don't know if you noticed. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Chair, may I just interject with a point of order? I, I know it's quite irregular at this point, but can I just make a quick it point? It seems a shame at this point, but go ahead, Simon. Um, as Councillor Weeks has not turned up and as Michael Muir is a substitute, would it be appropriate if, if Councillor Muir is accepting of it that, that we sub Councillor Muir for Councillor Weeks? We could certainly do that, but then we, yes, we could certainly do that. Um, but uh, um, it's a matter of knowing at what point um, Councillor Weeks isn't here. And we wouldn't want Councillor Weeks and Councillor Muir to have an argument in three minutes' time, would we? Um, so I will take advice. Um, Hillary. I would, yes, I, I would suggest that if we get to apologies and Councillor Weeks isn't here at that point, you announce that Councillor Muir is going to substitute. OK, I'll try and remember that. Could be difficult, but I will try. Can we on. have a substitute for Councillor? Do we have a substitute for Councillor Tart? Who's no. given apologies? No, we don't. So could he substitute for her? Different party, Anna. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'll move on to the proceedings. 
Uh, this meeting is being streamed live on the Council's YouTube channel and also recorded via Zoom. If live streaming fails, the meeting will adjourn. If the live stream cannot be restored within a reasonable period, then the remaining business will be considered at a later date. Please stay in view of the camera at all times. If for any reason the meeting is not correct, an officer will notify attendees by interjecting the meeting. The meeting will adjourn immediately. Once the meeting is correct, the meeting will resume. If the connection cannot be restored within a reasonable period, then the remaining business will be considered at a later date. If a remote member loses connection, the chair may adjourn the meeting for a short period to enable connection to be re-established. If the chair does not adjourn the meeting, the member will be deemed to have left the meeting at the point of failure and be deemed to have returned at the point of re-establishment. Only members present for the entirety of debate and consideration of an item are entitled to vote. Please ensure that your mobile phone and other noise emitting devices are muted. Please activate the mute button on your tablet or computer when you are not speaking and please be mindful that others can see you. If a member wishes to speak, they should use the raise hand button. If requested to vote, voting will be via the green tick for yes, red cross for no and blue raise hand for abstain, which are located in the participant section at the bottom of the screen. Are there any questions before we start the meeting? I just wanted to mention that Alexander Jarossi is now here. So welcome to the meeting. Any questions? Okay, thank you. I'll hand back to the chair, Councillor Judy Billing to start the meeting proper. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Anna. Um, so um, apologies for absence have now got terribly complicated. Um, apologies for absence that I already had were from Councillor Kate Art and Councillor Helen Oliver. I now deem Michael Weeks to have apologised um, for absence and therefore invite Councillor Michael Muir as a substitute to join the meeting, which he can do quite simply by switching his camera on. Can you do well, You've done it. Well done, Michael. OK, so... Um, and he's now moved across my screen. That's fine. Um, are there any other apologies that I haven't noticed? We know that Jean Green's likely to be late, but I'm not aware of any others. Um, I think you've just got to announce that Ian Albert is substituting for Helen. I'll do that then. OK, and I'm happy to say that Ian Albert is substituting for Helen Oliver. OK, so moving to Chair's announcements. This meeting tonight is about cooperative development um, and there's going to be a further meeting of the panel on the 9th of November, which will focus on the other half of our brief, which is community engagement. Um, I'd like to welcome all of those mm -hmm. who are participating this evening um, at the very first of these meetings. In accordance with council policy, this meeting is being audio recorded as well as filmed the audio recordings will be available to view on ModGov and the film recording by the, by the NHDC YouTube channel should you run out of Netflix opportunities um, over the next week or so. Members are reminded to make declarations of interest before an item. The detailed reminder about this and speaking rights is set out under Chair's announcements on the um, main agenda paper. Introduction by the joint chairs of the cabinet panel on community engagement and cooperative development is my next job. So as I've already said, this is the first meeting of a new panel, which we're quite excited about, um, but, but it's going to start gently over the next couple of months. Keith Hoskins and I are the joint chairs and we'll take turns, we'll take turns nicely in chairing meetings um, as the year progresses. The purpose of this panel is laid out in the terms of reference that have been included in the agenda, but the main and overall aim is to focus on community engagement and cooperative de development, which are both really important parts of this administration's aspirations um, and, and desire to make progress at all levels. Each meeting will focus on a particular theme and the councillors will choose the themes for future meetings. Although to start us off, the joint chairs have chosen the themes for the first two meetings. 
We will invite people and organisations to make presentations related to the theme of the meeting and will, wherever possible, include the views of members of the public and organisations attending to watch the meeting. Are there any questions so far? That was a bit of a garble. No? Okay. Well, tonight's meeting features cooperatives, and I'd like to hand over to uh, Councillor Keith Hoskins to introduce tonight's topic and speakers. Keith. Okay, thank you very much, Judy, and uh, my welcome to everybody as well. Um, about a year ago, uh, this council joined the Cooperative Council's Innovation Network, which for those of you who don't know, is a local government association special interest group. Cooperation, collective action, empowerment and enterprise are the founding traditions of the cooperative movement, but much of this remains uncharted territory for local government. A new report, Cooperatives Unleashed, is aimed at local authorities identifying how they can facilitate and enable growth in the cooperative sector. Produced by Plymouth City Council, I hope so. I'm delighted to welcome Anna Peachley uh, tonight, who is the Economy Partnerships and Regeneration Manager at Plymouth which is the first council in this country to commit to doubling the size of its cooperative economy, which already has, I think, 23 cooperative enterprises based in Plymouth, with a combined turnover of 18.6 million and a membership of over 9,500 people. I'm sure Anna will update me on that if, uh, if I've got that wrong. Uh, later, we'll hear from Jill Chapman from Create7 about uh, personal development for cooperation and collaboration, and also from John Webb from Transition Towns Letchworth, and we also have representatives from other interested organisations participating tonight. So thank you very much, you all, for turning up for this. I am now going to hand over to Anna to tell us how we can start on our road to uh, cooperative economy. Thank you very much, Councillor Hoskins. Um, I'm really delighted to have been asked to um, speak with you all tonight. I think the, the new committee that you've set up is very exciting. Um, certainly as we were undertaking the report, we were looking for examples of just this kind of thing. So I think there's a case study in the, in the making here. Um, so Anna, if you could go down to my um, next slide, please. So just a... a by way of background, this is just um, some of the Twitter handles that you can use to um, find out about what's going on with the um, CCIN network and um, in Plymouth, the at Invest Plymouth um, Twitter handle um, allows you to see um, any, any new developments that we're doing. Thanks, Anna. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to start with a bit of, so I know that <laughs> up on project background. Thank you. Um, so Councillor Hoskins uh, mentioned the, the report that uh, my team have written. My team, um, uh, we call ourselves the inclusive economy team and we get involved in all things inclusive economy. So social enterprise development, cooperative development, um, voluntary community sector resilience um, and we also have an inclusive growth program that my team um, facilitates. So uh, what we really wanted to do with this this policy lab um, as the, the CCIN network call them um, was to investigate what councils across the country are doing to um, develop cooperatives and it was really inspired by a report that the New Economics Foundation wrote. Um, I think it was commissioned by the um, Cooperative Party, but what we found when we did the report was that actually this is non-party political. We, we saw examples from across all types of councils and right across the UK. Um, and what we really wanted to do was identify um, what councils can do um, what, what's within their power and their influence um, to develop the cooperative economy. And as Councillor Hoskins said, we, we um, in Plymouth set ourselves a target to double the size of our cooperative economy by 2025. But we weren't the first people to come up with that target. That came from the New Economics Foundation's 
Cooperatives Unleashed report. Um, and, and they really came from a place that said that um, the economy should be more democratic. There should be a way that stakeholders um, have, have a proper stake in the economy and benefit from the wealth that's gained from the economy. So rather than um, investors that effectively gamble on the stock market, wouldn't it be great if the companies that we all care so much about were owned by the people who, who really benefit from them, from the employees and the customers and the wider stakeholders in, in that community. Um, and that's really what cooperatives do. They're a way of the um, stakeholders of a company owning that company, making decisions in a democratic way and benefiting from the, the profits and surpluses that are generated by that business. Um, so what the... Um, Cooperatives, the original NEF Cooperatives Unleashed um, report um, set as targets um, was by the mid, mid, mid 2030s um, to aim for a cooperative economy where they said half the population would enjoy the benefits of membership. Um, employees of cooperatives would represent 5% or more of the workforce and turnover would be equivalent to 10% of GDP. So those are really ambitious targets. Um, I think uh, currently uh, cooperative membership is around about 14 million members, um, so equivalent to just over 20% of the population. Um, and uh, they, they're still below 1% of employment, um, but that's still uh, nearly 250,000 people are employed by cooperatives. Um, according to Cooperatives UK and their, the database that they keep. So it's already a very significant part of the economy, but obviously the, the ambition to, to double that um, and achieve those targets that the New Economics Foundation have set for the mid-2030s, um, I think is a, a really ambitious but, but very achievable target. Um, so if you move on to the next slide, please, Anna. By way of background, I didn't want to assume that people know what a cooperative is. So I've just got a couple of slides that do that. Um, it, it's a popular misnomer that a cooperative is a type of business. And it's not really a type of business because um, all types of business can be cooperatives because um, cooperatives are actually businesses that adhere to a set of principles. And these principles are internationally recognised by the International Cooperative Association. Um, so there are cooperatives right across the world um, and they all adhere to the same principles and they all operate in much the same way. Um, so these cooperative principles and values, I, I don't expect you can read them, but, but you can certainly um, do a web search on cooperative values and principles and, and you'll see them. Um, if you move on to the next slide, Anna, I'll just um, explain what that looks like in practice. So it's the first four of the principles that really translate into the governing documents of a business. And as I say, they can be applied to pretty much any type of business. So things like um, voluntary membership. So um, you don't say that the members are anybody who lives in an area you say that anybody who lives in a certain area can join the cooperative. And in that way, it's a voluntary membership. Um, they're democratic in as much as um, every member has one vote and they have an equal vote. So it doesn't matter who owns the most shares. Everybody has an equal vote. There's financial participation. So very often um, that will be um, investment. But it might also be financial participation as a customer or as an employee. So um, depending on the type of stakeholders who are members of the cooperative depends on how that financial participation works. And there's also autonomy and independence. And that means that um, they're, they're not essentially um, controlled by government or another organisation. Um, which means that they, they really are controlled by the members. 
So in practice, as I say, that means that in the, um, the, the legal documents that underpin a company, it will define who the members are, um, who gets to make decisions, how people are appointed to a board, that kind of thing. And the members can be um, a mixture of customers, um, staff, residents, or, or a mixture of all of those. Um, and they have an equal say, as I, as I mentioned. Um, so it doesn't matter you know, how powerful um, people are in, in other walks of life. When it comes to co a cooperative, the members will have an equal say. But that doesn't mean that um, there, there, there can't still be structures of decision making. So very often there will be um, a board of members that are elected from the membership um, who will make decisions um, on the day to day running of the business. And then it might be at um, general meetings or annual general meetings where the wider membership is in, invited to have a say on the way that the company is run and the way that the profits are used. Um, in particular, um, I think it's important that the members choose what's done with um, profits and assets um, from the business. So um, you might be aware, for example, of things like the Nationwide Building Society, um, where you know, as a mortgage holder or a, an account holder, um, you'll be invited to the AGM each year. Um, but also the, the co-op supermarkets do the same. Um, you, you have a, a member card um, and they will invite you each year to, to say what you want to do with the money in your um, membership account, whether you um, keep it, have money off, products or you can invest it in um, community organizations that are nominated by the, the co-op supermarket. So, so those are just a few examples of how it works in practice. If we just move on to the next slide, Anna, I just want to reiterate that um, they, they really can be um, all sorts of types of business. So they can be um, for example, a group of three or more private businesses or sole traders that collaborate, or they can be a charity where all of the profits are reinvested um, in the charitable objectives and endeavours and activities um, and everything in between. So famous cooperatives that you will probably have heard of are the John Lewis Partnership, which is owned by its staff. Um, and then last year, Riverford Organics also became an employee cooperative, um, which was part of the succession plan um, from what was originally a family owned business. And similarly, um, Richard Sounds, the owner of the Richard Sounds had developed an employee share scheme, um, which he effectively gave um, more and more shares into the employee share scheme until that was owned by its staff. Um, so there's a couple of recent examples, Ardman Animations as well, um, another famous example. So often it's a succession plan for businesses. Um, some of the lesser known examples, of course, are the ones that are rooted in communities where the community will own um, a, a village hall or a market um, or um, other community asset. Um, that's run as a business, of, often bringing derelict um, buildings back into use. So there's just a, a few examples. Um, so if you just move on, Anna, um, I wanted to just uh, explain a bit about what we found with um, the research that we did for the report. There's a lot of information in the report. If you, if you want to go in and, and see case studies, um, it's really rich in um, examples of people who've been involved, um, <coughs> um, things that different things that councils have done. But we found that there, there were three main opportunities for development. And these are underpinned by about a dozen policy drivers that we found. So um, as legislation changes, for example, um, the Locality Act um, provided opportunities for communities to 
to run um, local services, for example. Some of those have um, developed as cooperatives. Um, but underpinning each of those, um, we found that in the main, there's either an asset, um, a sector focus, or a procurement focus by the what we call the large anchor institutions in an area. So the, the assets you, you might be familiar with, most um, councils will own community assets um, and elsewhere they'll have an interest, they'll have a development plan that identifies particular parts of the community where they, they've identified um, development opportunities. Um, the new planning um, white paper um, talks about growth areas, for example, that the councils will be able to nominate if it goes ahead as legislation. Um, but, but most councils will already pinpoint particular assets that they would like to um, see redeveloped. Um, and as I say, lots of councils will buy those particular assets, particularly where there's a market failure there. If they're in a deprived community, or if they're a brownfield site that's particularly um, difficult to develop, um, local authorities will often, or government will often get involved in, in buying up those assets. And so that's one way of identifying um, a, a, an area or a piece of land for, for development. And one of the great things about having an asset-based development is that it's very investable. Investors tend to like an asset. It's a bit like um, being able to have a mortgage on a building. They know that there's a, a value in that asset. Um, so it, it, it de-risks it quite considerably. Um, so secondly, the sectors. Um, so nationally, Cooperatives UK have identified particular sectors that are ripe for cooperative development. Um, in Plymouth, um, we looked at the sectors that are in our local economic strategy um, and picked the ones where we thought there was um, a particular opportunity for cooperative development. So things like cultural assets that are very often social enterprises anyway and have um, a, a lot of community support behind them. Um, also things like the care sector, um, one of the ones that uh, Cooperatives UK um, have, have really pushed is um, the digital sector. So there is an opportunity for um, kind of groups of people, however disparate, but with a, a common interest to set up um, a, a kind of an online service, um, whether it's retail or social media. Um, all sorts of digital services. Um, it, it, I think it's more difficult to do because obviously there's a lot of technical expertise required there, but it has been done and it, it is possible. And, and very often the, um, a lot of, of cooperatives, things like care cooperatives are actually based in a, a digital um, strategy. Uh, so for example, um, a, a group of carers who self-employed might come together and and manage the the way that they um, identify and market themselves through a website and through um, a, a digital management system um, and finally I just want to touch on what we call anchor institutions so I know but still back on the previous one thanks Anna um, so anchor institutions are the those kind of large um, institutions in each area, um, usually the council, um, very often universities, hospitals, um, if there are groups of doctor surgeries that work together, um, sometimes there will be a very large employer, um, you know, it might be a large private business in the area. It's the kind of um, businesses and organisations that have significant employment and significant buying power in the area. And we refer to them as anchor institutions because a lot of the supply chain that they use will be SMEs in the area. So they obviously have considerable power to look at where they are buying from 
um, and what type of organization they are buying from. And um, so sometimes this kind of strategy is referred to as community wealth building, although community wealth building is much wider than just the, the, the purchasing decisions of anchor institutions. But the, um, the, the, the famous example is in Cleveland, Ohio, where um, the hospital and the university um, set up a, a laundry between themselves and they cited it in a deprived community. Um, it meant that they um, could get involved, lots of the local hotels um, and um, care homes, for example, um, and it, it provided considerable employment for, for local people in that deprived community. Um, in Plymouth, um, the, the example that, that we use um, quite a lot is, is an interesting one. We developed a company called Catered, which supplies school meals in Plymouth. And it's a collaboration between the council and 65 schools. And one of the reasons it's, it's interesting um, is because uh, in the true sense of a cooperative, it's not really a cooperative because the council controls, has a controlling stake. And the reason that we've done that is because Catered then doesn't have to tender competitively. So essentially, um, it, it, it's a, a legislative requirement under public procurement rules but it means that those 65 schools have 49.5 percent controlling stake but it means that they they get to control um, how how the meals are provided how they're distributed between the schools it provides a lot more equality between all of the schools um, that previously suffered from having different budgets um, in in different parts of the city so it, it's an interesting example because it, it came out of the council. It was um, a, a council employee who kind of came up with the idea and drove it and, and is now the, the managing director, chief executive. Um, but also because, as I say, it's we're, we're kind of an affiliate of um, Cooperatives UK rather than a full member. Um, but so we refer to a cooperatively managed company as opposed to a full cooperative, but for all intents and purposes, obviously it, we, we maximise the, um, the, um, the, the delivery of the, the cooperative values and principles. It's very much founded in the community and it gives a lot back to the community. So that's just a few examples about where opportunities to, for development come from. You just go on to my last slide, Anna. Um, so I just want to talk about some of the um, underpinning principles. So we found that um, what, once you've identified an opportunity for a cooperative, then quite quickly the, the people who were involved gain the skills and understanding of what a cooperative is and how it operates. It's great, obviously, if people in your council have that understanding or in your community have that understanding to start with. Um, and that's often done through an awareness raising program. Um, and, and we use two opportunities um, in Plymouth um, and lots of councils get involved in these. So there's a social enterprise day each year. And um, this year it's on the 19th of November. It's always part of Global Entrepreneurship Week, which lots of um, councils and universities get involved with. In Plymouth, we run a social enterprise festival that week. And we have a, a programme of activities, usually four or five activities per day um, that's run by our local social enterprise network. Um, and the other opportunity in the summer, the last week of June and the first week of July each year is Cooperatives Fortnight. So, again, anything that's going on in the city at that time, um, we use as an opportunity to um, raise awareness about the cooperatives. We've got quite a lot of um, social clubs, for example, that are cooperatives, British Legions. Um, our local conservative club is run as a cooperative. Um, so we send out the, the posters that are, that are produced by Cooperatives UK. Um, and they also have a theme each year um, that we promote. And the theme next year is join a co-op. And Cooperatives UK has an ambition to create a million new members um, of co-ops and, and so 
you know we're really on board with that we want to see a lot more membership of our our cooperatives in Plymouth it's a really good way of helping people to understand what the benefits of cooperatives are um, finally I just want to make a, um, a, a mention of business support because um, for a lot of businesses um, whether they're cooperatives or not um, access to business support can be quite difficult you know people do search around for for where they can get support to, to grow and develop and even even start their businesses um, so it's really important that growth hubs and enterprise agencies are aware of what what you're doing locally um, and who they can partner with if specialist advice is needed there is a group of um, cooperative support specialists who've come together to um, uh, provide a service that's called the Hive. And I've provided the hyperlink there for it. You can see the, the list of providers on there. And there is, uh, I think, three or four um, that, that cover your area. Um, we found that for, for most um, business support questions, generic support works really well. But the, the fact that um, you've got this kind of stakeholder participation um, does, does raise issues in particular sectors where there's safeguarding, for example, um, and around charitable ownership. Those kinds of issues um, are, are much better going um, through specialist um, support providers just because they, they know it, they, they live and breathe it, and, and they can provide answers really easily, whereas um, the generic providers would probably just signpost you to information. Um, and so lastly, I suppose the thing to mention is um, finance. We found that actually most of the organisations who want to start a cooperative, as with any business, will be really determined about getting the money together. And there are some specialist investors for cooperatives and the number of them is growing um, we, we've got some local community cooperatives, for example, who who struggled initially and, and have had conversations with national um, investors, social investors or grant funders who've then gone on to develop um, specialist cooperative um, support funds and investment funds for them. So, for example, they, they might have done grants in the past. Um, but our our local cooperatives found that they didn't they didn't want a grant they wanted investment in um, shares in the cooperative um, and it found actually there's a, a really rich source of um, enthusiasm amongst a lot of grant funders now who are keen to get involved in this kind of development because it makes sense for everybody it means that the the community demonstrate that they've got a stake uh, in the business. Um, and there's often, as I say, an, an asset underpinning it and um, support from other um, institutional investors. Um, in Plymouth, we have a cooperative development fund ourselves. But um, even if you don't um, have anything like that locally, um, th there are, for example, Cooperatives UK have a specialist investment arm. There are there are places you can go for that that kind of support. You will you will find it if um, if the the tenacity is there to set up the business. Um, so I hope that's given you um, an overview. Um, and if you just go onto my last slide, it provides my contact details. Um, if if anybody is interested in um, knowing more about um, what's in the report, I would urge you to go and have a look at, at the report on the CCIM website, which is um, councils .coop. Um, C -O -P. Um, and it's called Cooperatives Unleashed. Uh, but if you've got any questions, please do get in touch with me. I'd be really delighted to hear about um, things that are going on in your area. And happy to hang around and take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anna. That's really um, interesting and useful background information for us all. Um, I was wondering while you were speaking um, whether you've disappeared from screen, but I was wondering while you were speaking whether some of the um, 
work that your leader has been doing in supporting the fishing industry um, over the pandemic is cooperative related at all. Um, so that's one question to start with. Uh, yes, well, our, our fish market is a cooperative yeah. in Plymouth. Yeah. Um, and the, the call for fish scheme, it, it's not set up as a cooperative, but um, it is set up um, as a collaboration between the, the fishermen and with the okay. fish market. OK, for yeah. people who don't know, Tudor Evans, the um, charismatic leader of Plymouth City Council, has been um, doing a lot with the fishing industry through the pandemic, including um, uh, YouTube videos of him cooking particularly delicious recipes. Um, so that's just something for, for Martin Steers Hanscom to think about um, what he would like to do in terms of, of, of cooking for North Hearts maybe in the, in the future. Um, so with that fascinating and valuable piece of background um, from me, um, and huge thanks to Anna, just before I ask for questions, um, I just want to um, welcome Jean Green to the meeting, who's joined during that um, during that um, presentation. So, are there any questions now? Um, Anna has um, directed you to where you can find loads more information from her and contact her. Um, but Alex Chirosi, unmute yourself, Alex. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's a kind of fairly straightforward question. This was a very useful um, um, perspective on the overview of the cooperative movement, which I think has got some really ambitious stuff in it. My key question here is, if we call ourselves a cooperative council, and I should say that I'm not, I'm not a council, I'm the chair of the North Arts CVS, what does being a cooperative council mean and what actually on the ground is the difference between a cooperative council and a, a council that is not cooperative? In other words, what actual concrete developments would you expect to see in a cooperative council that you wouldn't see in a council that didn't have that um, perspective against it? Okay, I'm happy for um, Anna to answer that, but obviously there are one or two things that Keith might want to say about what we what what it means to us in North Arts as a cooperative council, um, which we did declare ourselves very early on in this administration. So Anna, what, what, what do you think it means? I think the CCIN network was set up by a, a group of councils, and I think Plymouth was one of the founders, um, who could see that the cooperative principles um, apply very readily to that kind of public service. So we now have a corporate plan in Plymouth that talks about fairness and cooperation. Um, we, we go to quite significant lengths to engage with our stakeholders, with our um, residents and citizens in particular. Um, and if you look at the, the Co-op Council website, councils.coop, um, that there's a lot of case studies on there and it's not just about development of businesses it's about the way that the council delivers services using the cooperative principles um, which, which you know it, it's just an interesting take on it really um, that says that councils can't be cooperatives because of you know the legal structures of a local authority but they can operate using cooperative principles um, but I'm sure Keith will say more about why North Hertfordshire joined and, and what you want to achieve. Keith. Yeah, thanks very much. I mean, we're, we're very much, at, and I'm thanks, Emma, for being here. Uh, we're very much at the start of a journey. I think I made the point uh, in my opening remarks about um, much of this remains uncharted territory for local government. And it is about more than just setting up a business. I mean, as someone who spent um, 25 years of his working life uh, working for a not-for-profit, um, which wasn't quite a cooperative, but um, there, it's a shade of, if you like, um, we were very keen to see this. And it, it is, as Anna's mentioned, it's, I think it's an attitude of mind as well. It's about being uh, um, more, more of a welcoming and embracing, all-encompassing all 
Council, how we deliver our services, how we encourage others to do their, um, do their work. Uh, I'd be interested to know from Anna, where, where was the, how did you make the first step? Where was, where was the first commitment? How did you, you obviously came up with this sort of um, aspiration, but you've been so successful with this now, as we said, 23 cooperative enterprises turning over 18.6 million. So it's been quite a long process so far, but where was that first step? How did you get that information out to encourage uh, that to happen in your community? Thanks, Keith. So, um... I think there is a long history of cooperative development in Plymouth. Um, we had a, a huge cooperative society in Plymouth um, for over 100 years, I think. Um, you know, back in the 1920s, it was turning over a million pounds. Um, and uh, we had a cooperative development agency for a long time. Uh, sadly, um, closed down a few years ago. Um, and uh, as Judy mentioned, we had Tudor Evans, um, who's got a background in cooperative. Uh, I think he worked for cooperative sometimes and uh, did some cooperative development in the past. And he's been a councillor for decades. Um, so, so there's been quite a bit of um, uh, community economic development trust um, development. Our oldest ones are 25 years old in, in Plymouth. Um, they're not cooperatives, but, you know, they are very much founded on that basis of being part of the community and giving the community a voice and putting business development into the heart of particularly our more deprived communities. So I think it, it's um, it's come from, um, you know, perhaps, you know, some needs um, that, that it meets in Plymouth. Um, but also some champions and our, our current um, cooperative um, councillor, Councillor Pemberthy, really champions it. Um, and we make sure that, you know, if there's an opportunity to develop a new business that the council's involved in, we ask the question, can it be a cooperative? Um, it, it, as um, I, I, I'm sure... Um, uh, Alex, you you know, not not all um, social enterprises and charities um, work as cooperatives. Sometimes it's good to be a trust or a foundation um, or just a, a voluntary group um, is what's needed um, because that's that's the way that some things deliver the best. Um, but but where you, you've got um, that kind of financial participation and, and a viable business. Um, a cooperative is often a really good idea. Sorry, thank you very much indeed. I unmute myself. Simon Harwood. Thank you, Chair. Um, just really, I guess to follow on from Mr. Jarossi's question, uh, I mean, I, I'm struggling a little bit to understand what's the difference between a cooperative and a public private partnership? Um, they're not mutually exclusive. Some um, public-private partnerships, I think, are cooperatives. Um, it depends on the way the decisions are made. Um, it depends on the way that they're set up, um, whether there's a controlling stake. Um, and, and sometimes they, they operate as a, a cooperative without calling themselves one. OK, so I don't have any other hands up at the moment. So... I'm going to remind everybody that Anna has given us a lot of um, leads of places to find out more information. Um, I still feel, I know it's ridiculous, but I still feel as though she's travelled an incredibly long way to be with us this evening, even though I know she hasn't. It just, just I still have that sense about visitors to meetings. Um, so I, I'm incredibly grateful um, and I'm going to, Thank Anna now. She's more than welcome. She doesn't got a train to catch uh, to stay with us um, or, or to leave if she's seen enough of North Hearts for one evening. Um, but, but thank you so much. That was a really good start to our discussions and our deliberations and to the beginning of this cabinet panel. So thanks very much indeed.
Thank you and best of luck with your uh, action planning. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to do the cherry thing now and move on to um, item five, um, which is public participation. And um, those of you who are used to North Hearts meetings know that this is an opportunity we give um, at virtually all meetings. And we've got two uh, pieces of public participation. I'm going to take them in the order that we knew about them. And the first is Jill Chapman from Create7, who's going to be speaking on personal development for cooperation and collaboration. So over to you, Jill. Myself. Can you hear me okay? We can. Okay. Good evening, everyone. First of all, I must apologize because my internet keeps playing up. So uh, I keep getting kind of loop, coming totally out of the, the Zoom and back in. So apologies if you lose me temporarily while I'm talking. Um, but um, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me along to this, this panel this evening. Um, I'm here talking from Create 7, which is a, a CIC cooperative. Um, and we're based here in, uh, in Lechware. Um, first of all, to say, I, um, although I offered to talk, I didn't understand that I'd been um, asked to do a talk. So I will happily share with you some uh, things that we do and my thoughts around uh, the importance of development. Bear with me because uh, I feel a bit unprepared. <laughs> oh, Jill, uh, sorry, no, no pressure at all. Just, oh, just that, well, thank you for the opportunity to, to share. I'm, I'm very happy to talk, but it might be a little bit on the uh, on the hoof, if you like. But feel okay. free to ask any questions as well. All right. Um, so, um, so my background and my colleagues' background, the other um, the other founders of Create Seven, we're all psychologists, and um, I'm a business psychologist by profession. And so we set up Create7 as a cooperative um, about three years ago now, um, because it was really important for us to, to sort of hold an organization in a way that represented the future that we wanted to be developing people for. And so it's the, the values and the principles really of cooperatives that really attracted us to become one ourselves. Um, and the values and, and those core principles that we were looking at a moment ago, um, you know, we feel really strongly are what needs to be represented in, in society as a whole and, and, and in organisations. So it's fantastic to hear things like this are happening, which are really about, you know, development of cooperatives. Um, so in terms of, I'll, I'll bring up, I've, I've got a couple of um, a slides I'll bring up in a moment to demonstrate, just to talk through a little bit about what we mean in terms of personal development for cooperatives. Because if we come back to um, the actual word cooperate, the actual word being cooperative, you know, it's interesting to reflect what this actually means on a personal level. Um, because cooperating isn't always easy, is it? Um, you know, in a way, it's much easier, isn't it, to be in an organisation or be part of something where someone makes decisions for you or you're able to make decisions independently. Um, so cooperating is, um, although we all know on a logical level, we can see from those values and principles, and the reason we're all here, I'm sure, is we know logically this is this is a you know, a better way forward in terms of sustainability, in terms of equality, in terms of uh, building a future. You know, we're all talking about building back better at the moment. But the reality is that um, cooperation challenges us as human beings. And because as, you know, as psychologists, we're interested in people's uh, psychological mental development, but also just as human beings as a whole, as a person in terms of you know, our biology, our physiology and everything about us, it's, uh, it provokes and evokes reactions in us when, we, when we're in an environment where we need to cooperate. But interestingly, um, we're actually designed as humans to be more cooperative than competitive. But we've all, in particular in our Western world, been developed to be quite competitive. And so we feel there's a really important role to be had, really, in terms of um, 
opening up a space where we can all look at what are the what are the kind of you know we've talked a little bit about attitudes um and we've talked a little bit about kind of approaches and things but what are the what, what is it that we need to be developing in ourselves and taking responsibility for really in ourselves if we if we want to build a world that is more cooperative rather than competitive um, so um, I don't know if I can I share my screen I'm afraid yeah. sorry Jill that um, we, we can't uh, um, you can't share your screen we always have to have slides sent to us so that we can share them so I do apologize right. if you if the host the host can click a button to share the screen so I can share screen is that possible no we don't we don't do that we have to have the the uh, these um, screen, the presentation sent to us, I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. Um, well, the slide I was gonna show you was really um, just ind indicating the difference between um, what we used to call old leadership or traditional leadership, which is quite independent focus. So in terms of the way we're kind of often uh, developed at school or in our workplaces, we're often kind of looking to develop ourselves so that we can be independent. Um, whereas when we want to be cooperative, what we really need to do is to look at how we can be interdependent. And we're looking at collaboration, as I mentioned, rather than competition. And if we think about it, the reality is that when we're in an environment where we are collaborating and we're perhaps looking at working more interdependently rather than independently, a number of emotions can show up in us because there will be parts of us that might feel very strongly about our own views. There'll be parts of us that have strong uh, opinions or judgments or beliefs that we hold very closely and strongly, you know, in terms of what we do and how we live. And it may well be that they'll rub up alongside other people who might see the world in, in a different way or want something to happen in a different way or uh, wish to decide something and get an outcome that's different from the one that we that you desire. And so that can really, because, because we're designed in a way where our nervous system and designed in a way where our minds want to protect us from any sense of fear or threat, that can often kind of react in us in a way where we can get very, um, fixed, you know, we can we can respond in ways which is about protecting our own views, our own opinions, our own ways of doing things. And so it's important we feel that we all, um, me included, you know, everyone in this, uh, all find ways and use kind of evidence-based scientific approaches that allow us to, um, to get a little bit more flexibility, if you like, in terms of how we think how we respond to challenges, how we behave, and to be able to let go at times. Let go maybe of something that we're doing or something that, we're, um, that we're, we feel is important for the, for the benefit of the whole. And that's not an easy thing to do, is it? <laughs> You know, particularly if you've put a lot of time and investment into something, sometimes it might mean that for benefit of the, the whole picture, the whole cooperative or, um, you know, what's going to benefit your, your members or your customers or whoever you're serving, you may need to let go a little bit of what's, what's important for you. So, um, so yeah, so our work, you know, is, is interesting because we are a cooperative as an organisation, we hold those values, but we're actually interesting in developing what we do is we develop um, individuals, we develop teams, we develop organisations um, in their psychological development, really, in their ability to become more flexible, more agile, and really so that they can then build their organizations or build whatever they're doing to become more cooperative, more collaborative, um, and to really think about how what they're doing helps build a more sustainable future. Um, so there's a lot of, lot of work. There's uh, some other slides I'm happy to share. And Okay, I was going to ask whether we could find a way of sharing those um, 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 amongst this panel and, and our visitors. 
after the meeting and I'm sure uh, committee services will help find a way to do that that would be really good yes chair we'll we'll ask um Jill to send us send us the present the um slides and then we'll send one to the members thank you okay okay yeah so happy to share them around and happy to take any questions okay anyway. brilliant thank you very much Jill um let me just get rid of that chat bit so I can see the list of participants Bear with me. That's it. Um, so are there any questions? Thank you very much, Jill, for that. I'm sorry you were taken unawares, um, but are there any questions at this point? <laughs> it may be that we need to see the slides and then form our questions, I think. Yep, that's how it's looking. So thanks very much indeed, Jill. Um, I've been asked to ask um, speakers to um, go off camera when they're not speaking. Um, is that right, Hilary? Yes, Chair, and then the YouTube stream just shows them um, those speaking. Ah, the I see. I can't, well, I, okay, I didn't want that to be an unfriendly thing to do, so I, I thought I'd better ask why it was. No, I get that then. Thank you very much indeed. Our second um, item of public participation, sorry, John, I'm not calling you an item really, um, under public participation, um, under item five, is from John Webb, who's going to talk about Transition Towns um, Letchworth. So you're very welcome, John. Um, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Can I just check with Mark that uh, everyone can hear me? It's not very brilliant. Um, how about this? It's okay, but it's still not brilliant. Oh dear, I always have this problem. I won't try and change anything now, but if I speak slowly, okay. I've not got much to say. All right. Thank you. Um, um, Transition Town Lecturer uh, is uh, um, an educational charity. Um, we wish to extend a warm welcome to the new enterprise panel. Jolly good initiative. Um, the long-term effects in this area of the COVID-19 pandemic have yet to become clear, yet a few trends are already emerging that favor local, community-based and cooperative patterns of working. So this panel is itself a timely initiative by the District Council. The Worldwide Transition Network is focused on urgent local action uh, towards a low-carbon low future over the decades to come. It is not about emergency measures, but rather about strategic and coordinated action. Um, in this context, transition is thought of as applying to households, yet climate change has no such boundaries. So we are concerned with carbon saving right across business, institutions, and powers that be as well. We bring practices and, and examples from farther afield to bear on local issues of long-term resilience. For instance, in December 2017, we brought out a report on working towards a, quote, resilient and thriving town centre. This has a chapter on nurturing businesses that includes a section on cooperating ventures in terms of their suitability for reversing a decline in the town centre. Already this seems dated in terms of the town centre focus now that there are new issues to be faced, for example, with so many people taking up working from home and over the internet. In closing, I'll mention a community initiative that uh, Transition Town Network, TTL, is exploring, a repair and scrap store project. This is at such an early stage, we've only had one discussion meeting, that I'll just invite you to read an invitation to take an interest or take part, or to watch a short video that we've compiled, and perhaps join us for a Zoom-based meeting on Thursday, 29th October. Um, the links for these are already on the Transition Town Network 
home pain. I noticed the Zoom meeting and the short video. Again, we welcome the Council of the New Enterprise panel and we wish you strength to your elbow in promoting community-based cooperative businesses in this district. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed, John. Um, and it was hard to hear, but I think we, we got the gist of that. Um, and maybe we can have you back to a panel uh, and get your audio stuff sorted out in advance so that we can have a, a, a better dialogue with you. I do apologise, Chair. No, Thank no, you no, it's not for you to apologise. We just need to get it better between us in Thank a you. cooperative sort of way. OK. Yes, indeed. Thank you. So um, are there any um, questions for John? OK, not at the moment. We also have with us, of course, uh, ah, Keith. Yeah, just to say, I think we've got uh, John's um, submission in hard copy anyway, so we could perhaps circulate it with Jill's yeah. um, slides. That'd be a brilliant idea. Yes, thank you, Keith, for reminding me of that. Yeah. We've also got with us um, North Heart Centre for Vol Council for Voluntary Service, um, Citizens Advice North and um, Citizens Advice North Hertfordshire. And I don't know if there are any comments that they'd like to make at this point or uh, join in at any point, but you are welcome to do so um, whenever you would like to, all of you, um, from those two organisations, because we're really, really pleased to have you with us tonight. If you want to um, listen, sorry, I've just noticed the cat, Hannah. How lovely. Um, if you want to join in, you're very welcome. But also, if you just want for tonight to listen, that's fine as well. So thanks very much. But just put those blue hands up um, when you do want to speak. Um, is there anything that you've heard tonight? Anybody, the committee, um, visitors, that you want to explore further at this point? Or are we just happy to absorb what we've heard? Silence says absorb. What do you think, Keith? Do you think silence says absorb? Ian Albert wants to speak. All right. Hello. Hello. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Um, I, I guess the, the main thing, I mean, it's probably a question for, for, for Keith, in, I think, but I mean, obviously for other colleagues here, and obviously thanks for the, the everyone for the presentations and especially Anna, you know, for, uh, first of all. I, I guess I guess the real challenge is is about with 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 this is actually knowing where to start and having mm -hmm. and, and actually getting something off the ground or finding an initiative that we could get off the ground or bringing together a, a group of people a bit like we did earlier in the week in Hitchin where we had that sort of arts and culture discussion and trying to work through a you know, could bring to get people together for a fairly collaborative, cooperative uh, uh, approach. Uh, I'd be interested to kind of get your 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 views, or maybe even from 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 Chloe, one of our council officers, about, about what where we think the right sort of starting place is, or what can we do in order to try and kind of galvanise some some activity and and new initiatives. Because um, for me, it's always been the thing that's really the hardest to yeah. to know. It's a it's an amazingly op load of opportunities and 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 it's a great ideas that, that are floating around. But just trying to actually get one to get going, I suppose, is the is the key. I'm really interested in. And whether you've got any views or any other colleagues here have any views about where we might get started on something. Okay, thanks very much indeed, Ian. I've got Alex wanting to speak, and then I'll go back to Keith on that as well. Um, Alex, where are you? Yeah. Your very your face is very dark. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, really, not not necessarily any any answers for tonight, but I think going, moving forward, from the voluntary sector's point of view, we'd probably like to see what the kind of approach is to working with community organisations and working with uh, voluntary sector organisations in some kind of way, in some sort of partnership. That seems to be probably where we want to be having a conversation perhaps a bit further down the line because obviously we've established earlier on that there you know 
the North Arts District Council is not in a sense a business like, like you have in the private sector, but there is a set of values which is important for the cooperative movement. So it seems to me for the voluntary sector point of view, what we're looking at is a sort of a transfer of those values in terms of the relationships that go on between community organisations, between and the council, and between those who are looking for funding and how funding applications are looked at. That whole process could be sort of just how that is shared really between, the, between all of those parties. But that's okay. not, a, not, a, not a discussion we can have now. I'm simply putting down a cup, perhaps a marker for where perhaps we could have a conversation later, a bit later on. Well, in fact, we have um, made the top line commitment to those values yeah. uh, hmm. by, by becoming a cooperative council. Yeah. But it, it, it's what that actually means further down the line is what yeah. you're asking. Precisely, yeah. Um, no, I don't think we need to know what it's going to mean further down the line. I just think it's 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 about sort of working out that this is something we do need to work out further down yes. the line. Sure. Okay. Um, I'm going to bring in Simon Harwood and then I'm going to go back to Keith. <clears throat> uh, rather worryingly, I find myself agreeing with Councillor Albert on, on, on regular occasions these days. I think uh, that's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I... Uh, you know, I, I really do think that we've got to work through, call it what you will, a case study, a pipe cleaner, pilot program, or whatever you want. And I'm wondering, Chair, whether the obvious place to start, whether it is ultimately the right idea or the wrong idea, is with the commercial service director and the commercialization strategy and looking at some of the ideas that are in the top 10 of the list there and seeing if any of them lend themselves to a cooperative approach. Yeah, I'm sure. Keith? Well, yeah, I can be truly in the spirit of completely cross-party here because I'm going to agree with Al Ian Albert and Simon Harwood. Um, and I think Ian's quite right. The, the first step is, is the most difficult one. And I was trying to tease out from Anna Petrie a bit more about how they'd made their first step, not realising that Plymouth had got such a, uh, a history and tradition of cooperatives anyway. <clears throat> Excuse me. And... Um, I can imagine there's going to be some emails flying backwards and forwards between uh, myself and Anna over the next few days just to try and uh, get a bit more out of that. It, it is something that, I mean, we've got Steve Crowley and Chloe on this call anyway, because we are looking at that. And there is somebody now dedicated within their team to um, manage and look at cooperatives and drive it forward. I think we've also, we could perhaps have work to do with the CAB uh, when they're giving business advice, that we can perhaps incorporate the whole concept of um, uh, cooperative enterprises in, into what they can offer or as advice to uh, people, uh, particularly in, in the current climate where uh, uh, people are looking perhaps to start a new career or a new business, uh, not necessarily through any fault of their own. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's... Um, Simon mentions the point of the case study, but we, we have got sort of one or two community um, type projects going. I mean, Hitchin Initiative itself was a sort of quasi, is there a way that that can be developed as that grows? Uh, Hitchin Festival, I can only quote Hitchin ones at the moment too, I'm afraid. Hitchin Festival, again, it's a quasi cooperative. Is there a way that that can be uh, encapsulated more as a cooperative organisation? So I think we've got to look at what, what we've already got established, uh, are there ways of um, extending those in, in to establish them as cooperatives um, before we start with um, new ones, but always with an eye to that being an offer from Hitchin Market itself. I mean, that's another one that could be looked at. So there are lots of opportunities for us to look at cooperatives. It's just finding the one that's going to launch us. OK, well, Anna has written in the chat line that she'd be delighted to discuss some of the recent cooperatives that they've set up and supported and that Councillor Penbethy, who's the Cabinet Member for Cooperative Development, has offered to support us as well. So that would be that would be really great going down the line. Um, I, Simon, at, have you put your hand up again or is that what we call a legacy hand? No, it is a real uh, hand raised. OK. Here. Um, I, again, just, you know, to ask blindingly obvious questions, which are probably very stupid questions, but I just want to check that, that there is no difference in operating a cooperative in terms of the business case 
as opposed to a sole source business or a partnership. I mean, the idea has to be a solid business idea that has good return on investment and the normal principles of business. There's nothing special about a cooperative that, that necessarily makes it um, less financially attractive from a business, is there, if, if you understand my question? Keith? I, I wouldn't think so, Simon. I mean, there are going to be shades of variation, I think, on this, uh, for want of a better expression. Um, it may not be so um, profit focused, if you like, um, and such surpluses as it generates will be, um, there will be a decision as to whether that goes to shareholders and equality or whether it gets invested further or or it gets involved in the communities it's what the i suppose the aims of that cooperative are when it's set up and the, and the values to which it adheres martin yeah. you said you want to speak yes um thank you chair i'm still mulling over what i'm supposed to cook for north heights and uh, okay. i'll have my answer I'll, at some time but leaving that, as, leaving that aside um I, I think there's several points I, I wanted to make. In answer to, to Simon's point, um, in terms of our cooperatives different from traditional businesses, there's some very good statistics out there from Cooperatives UK, which, uh, and effectively, in a nutshell, they say that cooperatives are harder to get going because you have to have that sort of structure and some of the things that Jill talked about in terms of getting a group of people together to, to get a constitution and so on. But once they are set up, they are twice as successful as traditional businesses in terms of survival after the first five years. So that's roughly uh, in terms of, uh, of statistics. But the point I wanted to make though, that was, uh, yes, it's very clear that there isn't the tradition here um, of um, cooperatives as there is in Plymouth and in some other places. Uh, and obviously that is a, um, a, a difficulty and having, been involved in, in trying to get cooperatives going over the last 30 years, I suppose, in North Arts. I know some of the attempts we've made and some of the successes and, and some, of, some of the more difficult things. But I would remind you, we do have a case study uh, about um, 17 years old now of a successful cooperative in North Arts, which is the Black Squirrel Credit Union, which is a financial cooperative, which was very much a cross-party um, uh, uh, venture and um, work through from the very basics of getting, um, having a business idea and, and working through to, to, to being successful. And, and in terms of where we are now in general, I would say uh, this evening has been extremely helpful because um, it helps us know that we have, through the contributions various people make, we've got another example of, the, of a cooperative in Create7, and it's great to see Jill here. We've got a set of tools that uh, we know from Anna, from the Cooperatives UK and so on that um, people around us could use. And to take one example, I think um, Ian mentioned, was we had uh, a group of people in arts and culture who, who are finding it very difficult at the moment, who may actually want to use some of those tools to set up that type of business, whether it's Hitchin um, Festival going forward or whether it's some of the, the groups there, whether they get together, they market as a, as a cooperative, whether they um, individually create cooperatives. There are a number, of, uh, as Anna said in her piece, there are a number of different ways in which people can be cooperatives. Um, and, uh, you know, that's an opportunity. It, it's well worth taking up because the, uh, as I say, the, the results, if once you get going, um, can be extremely good. and. Uh, um, if you look at some other countries, and, and uh, it's very fascinating, look at the uh, United States, if you think the most capitalist country in the world, they have a fantastic cooperative sector, which is very well developed. So there's some good examples around. Okay, thanks very much, Martin. Before I um, move on to the next item on the agenda, I just want to, without putting anybody on the spot, just want to ask Rosie whether um, anybody from Citizen Advice North Hearts wants to say anything. It's not compulsory. I just didn't want the opportunity to pass without you feeling it was a possibility. 
No, um, I don't think we do. I'm here to listen today. I think this is really interesting. Um, at the voluntary sector, we're good at collaborating and we share a lot of these values. So I'm interested to see how it develops and, and how we might get involved at some point. OK, thanks very much, Tracy. I, as I say, I wasn't meaning to put pressure on. I just wanted to make sure that everybody was welcome and that everybody knew that they were able to speak if they wanted to. OK, so I've got no more blue hands up. And I'm going to therefore, I think, move on to item seven, um, which is because we sort of slipped through item six without me saying that's what we were doing. Um, and into item seven, which is the information note, work program and action track action tracker, um, uh, which is a, a, a thin thing at the beginning. Uh, but we've got Steve here somewhere. Um, who's going to suddenly pop onto the screen. There he is, the service director, Steve Crowley. Thank you, Chair. Go for it. Thank you very much. It's not, I guess, as you said, it's not, there's not much to share at the moment in the fact that what we've done within the information note is purely set out as we see the proposed formatting for the work programme and also the action tracker. They are in Appendix A and the aim is from what takes place at the meetings we we'll update the action tracker and also it will help us to decide what we discuss at our future meetings within the work program the other thing we have already set up which we hope will help with communication is in 3.1 of the report we've set out an email address to to ensure that it's not just going through do i say the council's uh, general customer services so we've got a specific email address which is uh enterprise panel at north heart uh, sorry north hyphen hearts.gov.uk so that's where we are at the moment obviously in future meetings we will be able to actually go through any actions which are set out within the action tracker thank you very much indeed are there any um questions or comments from members at this point i'm going to then go back to keith i think because we're nearly at the end of what we've um, set out for this tentative step into this world for this evening. Mm -hmm. Keith, do you want to uh, add anything? Um, I don't think so. There's a, there's a lot there for people to digest. Um, we're going to go away and talk some more. I would urge everybody to, if they can, to look at the um, Cooperatives Unleashed document um, and see some of the examples on that. Uh, we'll get other examples around the place, but um, Steve has talked about the uh, email. If, if I, I would welcome people's ideas and suggestions uh, for us to uh, take this forward. OK, thank you very much, Keith. On the 9th of November, which is our next meeting, awfully close to this one, um, we've decided to focus on um, community engagement and the way that the council engages with uh, um, social media um, organisations and we've invited a number of um, mo uh, moderators of Facebook pages, uh, both geographically based across the district, but also some communities of interest to have a full and frank discussion with them about the ways in which they would like to uh, work with the council and the ways in which council officers and councillors in particular um, can best work with them. So I think that's going to be um, quite a fascinating and possibly robust um, evening and discussion when, when we come to it. Um, but then we will be moving on then um, to February the 1st, which will be our um, third meeting, um, which um, could focus back again on the cooperative side, um, but I don't think we're religious about that, are we, Keith? No, okay. So ideas that, that members have, um, and I include there members from the organisations that are here, as well as councillors who are here, that you might have when you've thought about and digested this meeting tonight, um, you can al always um, email um, on the line that uh, Steve Crowley just set out for us and um, councillors can certainly email Chloe and Hillary with any ideas that they have and also actually 
email myself and Keith because we'd be yeah. really glad to hear um, people's ideas. So Steve's told you about our dedicated email address, um, which is enterprisepanel at northhearts.gov.uk. Um, and this is my last call for anybody who wants to say anything at all. So no, it looks as though we all want our supper. Is that right? Oh, just a message, because it looks like a nice message. I like nice messages um, from John Webb to say an excellent start to the new cabinet panel. Thanks and stay well. Thank you very much, John, for saying that. That's really lovely. And uh, gives me a marvellous moment to say thank you to everybody um, for coming out on this cold, wet night. Oh, no, <laughs> you didn't come out, did you? Um, uh, it's been great to see everybody. And thank you and good night.